this is Sam of Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, and other platforms. And if you can help to keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page. The link should be in the description. So, regular listeners may know that last month I posted an initial lecture about the history of China, the early development of the civilization in China from prehistoric times, through the Shang and Zhou dynasties, and through the era of fragmentation, the periods called the Spring and Autumn period and the Warring States period, up to the unification of China under the first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi. So, something that I put aside to save till later. Much like when I discussed India, I left the origins, the foundations of Hinduism apart as a subject to discuss on its own because it's so complex and multi-layered. I've done the same here when it comes to China, and I want to talk now about Chinese philosophy and the beginnings of the distinctive Chinese worldview through this same period. The beginnings of Chinese philosophy really came about in that era of fragmentation after the effective breakdown of the Zhou dynasty and in those periods that in retrospect we call spring and autumn period and the warring states period. And philosophy in China really came about in this particular situation. And it seems that certain strains of thought, certain ways of understanding and reasoning about the world first arose, although we don't know much from the original surviving texts, but it seems they first arose in the spring and autumn period and then really developed into sophisticated schools, almost like institutions in Chinese society in the Warring States period. And most of the earliest texts that have been found from these philosophical schools come from the Warring States period. So this era, as I said, from about the 1100s BC up until the rise of Qin in the 200s BC, followed in the aftermath of the breakdown of the Zhou state. And technically, through most of this era, there were still technically Zhou kings on the throne at their capital at Luoyang, but they had really become rulers in name only, with no real effective control over the country. So it was an age of fragmentation into many small states and principalities that existed in shifting alliances and rivalries, and that over the centuries saw increasing violence as a few powerful states arose and attempted to conquer their neighbors. Now, one of the legacies of the Zhou era that continued through this age of fragmentation was the so-called Xie, the class of scholars, scribes, and administrators, of sort of literate professionals who often traveled around among the different states looking for patrons. So rather than having one central imperial government to serve, they looked around, and some of them turned at times, it seems, to speculation, to teaching, and to writing on philosophical questions. And the viewpoint of these Shia scholars who turned to philosophy was rooted in disillusionment and a sense of crisis that then gave rise to a series of questions. Questions like, in this aftermath of social and political breakdown, how can a wise or good person live? How can they live amidst the disorder, the disunity, the corruption of society? And for some of them, how can society be reordered? Can authority be restored? And there were a series of different ways of responding to this crisis. And the fragmentation and the uncertainty of this era gave rise to a sort of flowering of philosophical speculation in ways that have really interesting parallels to certain other countries, such as you might think of Greece, the rise of philosophy in the classical age when Greece was divided among many small statelets, and also India. India, in the same basic time period, was broken up into the various so-called Moria city-states. And in this environment where the country is fragmented into these contending statelets, it can give rise to questioning about why societies work the way they do. When each one has its own different laws, its own different customs, is there any sort of universal principle or universal source of authority or legitimacy. And you can see what happened in China in light of this broader 
concept of the so-called axial age, which was first posited by the philosopher Carl Jaspers in the 1950s, who argued that there was a sort of common trend all around Eurasia in basically the same time period when societies were coming out of the fall and the breakdown of Bronze Age empires, which had had central systems of law and authority backed up by the technology of bronze. But now that those systems had fallen apart, one could no longer simply rely upon imperial laws and doctrines. And so those who were looking for authority as say, these Xi officials were in post-Zhou China, they had to search for new foundations, new arguments for authority and legitimacy. And these new ideas could often be humanistic, were often based on a sense of reciprocity, the golden rule. And so one can see many parallels then with the West, with phenomena, not only like the uh, Greek philosophers in Athens, but also the Hebrew prophets, the beginnings of Christianity. And these sorts of parallels can be very illuminating, but one also has to be cautious because on the other hand, they can also be distorting. China was a different society it was still isolated from the West and even from India in the Warring States period. And one has to think of the particular roots in Chinese ideas, the particular sorts of questions and preoccupations that made Chinese thought different. So if we look at those first, if we think back to what we know, what we can reconstruct from some surviving texts, inscriptions, from archaeology, sites of worship, sacrificial offerings, we can get some understanding of how people thought about the world and about society in the Shang and Zhou eras. So it does seem there was an all-pervasive belief in the importance of harmony and balance. There was an abhorrence for disorder and disruption. And it seems that people in all different parts and classes of Chinese society believed in striving for a harmonious world based on dependable rhythms and rooted in the balancing of different forces. So one could say roughly, it seems, the goal of life into which people put their greatest efforts and, and literally their greatest sacrifices was to live in harmony among the cosmic forces. And part of this worldview is captured in the early cosmogony from China. So that's the, the myth of the creation of the world and the cosmos. And so there is a very old cosmogonic myth that involves the first man, which is not unusual. Many societies around the world have some central myth dealing with the sort of primeval man. But in this Chinese cosmogony, we are told that initially the universe was contained within a single egg, sort of like, you know, the way we talk about the Big Bang. There was at first an egg. This egg hatched and the shell broke into two parts. The top half became the sky, the lower half, the earth. From the middle of the egg hatched the first man, who was called Panku. And this man grew larger and larger for thousands of years, along with the earth and the sky, as they also grew. Until after thousands of years, Panku finally died. And after he died, his body then also split into many parts. His head became the sun and the moon, his blood the rivers and the seas, his hair became the forests, his sweat the rain, his breath became the wind, his voice the thunder, and the fleas from his body became the ancestors of humankind. So in some respects, this myth is not so unique. It's not uncommon, as I said, for societies to have a story of an original cosmic man where the, his body became the primal materials of the universe. But there are also two distinctive themes in this particular story that make it distinctive. One is how it casts human beings as very small, minor entities and as dependent, even parasitic, upon the other parts of the universe. We are all, in a sense, descended from the fleas on that original body of the world. And it raises then, it points to this question of how people can live and survive. If we are so tiny, so dependent, and so vulnerable as fleas, how can we live and survive 
while we are depending on these enormous, powerful forces beyond our control. And this sort of view of things makes sense if you think of the landscape of China and the environment that I spoke about last time in China Part 1, how people were able to draw enormous food supplies and bounty from the land, but were constantly subjected to the dangers and the fury of that same environment, the storms, the tremendous floods. So the same rivers that might be bringing the water and the silt that allow you to grow crops and to live and prosper also can at any given time, any given springtime, suddenly massively flood and wipe out your entire known world, really. The other important theme that one can see in this primeval myth of Panku is the emphasis on dualities, the balancing of opposed but complementary principles. So if you think in this cosmogony, the egg that was originally one whole object split into the earth and the sky. They become uh, complementary principles. And then this is further repeated and concatenated through the different stages of the story, like the head of Panku, the cosmic man, which split into the sun and the moon. And then further, it seems all through the earliest myths and, and stories and poetry that we can find from early China, the cosmos is organized, it's understood in terms of binaries, complementary and contending opposites, light and dark, hot and cold, wet and dry, and also on the human level, male and female, masculine and feminine. And sometimes these different complementary principles were grouped together into sort of two broad categories, yin and yang, right, which are understood to stand for the masculine and the feminine, the light and the dark, and so on. So one can see these basic kind of deep themes underlying all of early Chinese thought. But there were also particular beliefs and particular practices that took shape and developed among particular social groups and classes as Chinese society grew and stratified. So you can see a sort of system of elite beliefs that really crystallized in the Zhou dynasty. And they focus, first of all, on ancestral worship, right? Reverence and offerings to dead ancestors who are understood to have moved on into the spiritual realm and become sort of heavenly principles, almost like gods. They also, it seems, could act as intercessors between humankind and these ultimate powerful cosmic forces. And then ultimately beyond those even to the one divine principle, which is called heaven or the high God. And this heaven is abstract and impersonal. It's not associated with any sort of tangible force like air or water, but it was associated symbolically with the North Star, the one pole around which the whole heavenly sphere rotates. There was a highly developed Shang and Zhou imperial cult, which you could see as kind of the ultimate capstone on this whole system of ancestral worship. The king was sometimes referred to as the first man. In a way, you could see that as him representing or standing in for that first cosmic man, Panku, or as sort of the ultimate leader, the head of all of humankind. And the emperor had a special connection to heaven and also to certain elemental forces of nature, like the mountains, the rivers, and storms, and so could act as sort of the highest most powerful intercessor for humankind, linking the heavens and human society. And then around the emperor, of course, there was the role of this Shi class, which it seems developed first as the core of priests and diviners who managed certain shamanic and divinatory rites, such as scapulomancy, right? Divining and pronouncing prophecies based on animal bones. But they also developed as the kingdom grew and became more sophisticated. They also became an administrative and managerial class, dealing with treasuries, granaries, armies, all these sort of tangible, practical machineries of government. Now, outside of this sort of elite sphere of the upper class, the veneration of powerful ancestors, the emperor, the she. Outside of this, it seems there also was a body of popular beliefs, 
that had some commonalities but was also distinct. And there are references in early documents to the practices and ideas of the so-called nung, which is the term for the lower echelon of society, the peasantry, the peasant farmers, who had the lowest status but who were not, were not abject slaves or serfs like you might find in some other societies, who did have some degree of rights and protections. And the nung directed a great deal of their veneration to two important deities, a deity of the earth and of the grain, which naturally were the most immediate and important to them as farmers. And it seems there were shrines to these two gods in every village, and they were understood as sort of special patrons of the peasantry and not important to the elite, to the imperial elite. And in this way, the, the Nung had access, you could say, had contact through their worship, through their offerings, directly to these important gods. They did not have to go through the imperial cult. And they also had their own intercessors or specialists in communication with the divine and spirit worlds who were called the Wu. So these were, you could say, spiritual servants of the common folk, not the elite. And one can see them as sort of folk healers, shamans, somewhat similar to the people who were called cunning folk in Europe. The Wu could contact the spirit world. They could placate angry spirits or also invoke aid from good spirits or gods. And they also, it seemed, performed rites especially for fertility and for rain. And one ritual that was described in early texts was the Wu dancing a strenuous dance in the sun and their drops of sweat would then call forth the rain. So there were all of these complicated, layered, and in some ways related beliefs, it seems, already current in China by the end of the Zhou dynasty. But then, of course, how do people respond to the political dilemma after the collapse of the Zhou regime into disorder and fragmentation? One major question, especially that the Shi, the most learned, literate class, that they had to answer was, how do they establish the legitimacy of leaders and rulers? How can anyone have the right to govern? And on what basis? In the Zhou dynasty, ultimate authority had always flowed from the king himself, who was the first man, and who in this way was the representative of humanity to heaven. Well, if authority now in this new order doesn't flow from the king and from the imperial ancestral cult, then on what basis does anyone have authority? What undergirds and legitimates the state and also what undergirds and legitimates the social order? On what basis does anyone, a lord, a patriarch, a father, have any authority to rule over anybody? And this crisis led to the birth of new schools of what we'll call philosophy, in quotation marks, even though that originally is a Greek word, right? So even talking about Chinese philosophy, you're necessarily drawing a parallel to the West and to Greece. But here we'll, you know, we'll use the word philosophy broadly to basically mean any attempts to discern more universal and abstract principles to guide life or society. So people begin to philosophize when they move from efforts to solve specific immediate problems, like how do we gather up a granary, a grain supply to feed an army? Or how do we placate a malicious spirit that is attacking a village or causing disease? When people move beyond those specific immediate problems to efforts to solve broader, more general questions that transcend specific moments. And this happened on many fronts, it seems, in the spring and autumn period. And it led to an age of what's been called the Hundred Schools. So there was a proliferation of groups, you could call them sects or schools, that gathered around teachers, that grappled with these questions, that developed their own theories. And most of these hundred schools are long lost. We do not know what they thought or what they said. Maybe there might just be a mention, an allusion in some text here or there, but most of them are long gone. But a few of them, it seems, did grow and survive through time, and hence they are remembered thousands of years later. So if we think back to this question of legitimacy, how can any social order 
have legitimacy? How can anyone have authority if the king no longer governs? Well, people advanced different responses to this question, and one of them, it seems, was there is no answer. There is no real legitimacy. There is no truly authoritative social order. And this view, this view of simple disillusionment, it seems first was expressed by people who decided to withdraw from society, who were completely disaffected, who rejected society as an artificial imposition, and who withdrew out into the wilds and became hermits. So there are early references to this sort of class of hermit sages who portrayed society as inherently corrupt and corrupting, who concluded that there was no legitimate social order, and who withdrew especially into the forests and the western uplands of China. Some of them, it seems, just lived out their lives in isolation this way, but some also gathered followers. And most of their teachings, again, have been lost to time. But one partial exception is the sort of group that gathered around a hermit wise man who put forward certain teachings involving what he called the Tao. So this is the beginnings of what we now call Taoism. And Taoism began in the spring and autumn period. There are no original documents surviving from that early age that tell us exactly what this school of sages thought. But a lot of the story can be reconstructed from later histories and chronicles written like during the Han Dynasty and by commentaries uh, about Chinese society, Chinese history that made reference to them. So there was an early alleged teacher of this school of thought surrounding the Tao who was named Yang Ju, assuming that he was a real person and not purely legendary. There was this Yang Ju and almost nothing is known of him except that reportedly he was radically individualist. He did subscribe to this idea that people in China should strive for order and harmony, but he believed that ultimately that order was not social or political, but individual, in the individual personality and way of life. So that's about all we can say about Yang Ju, but it seems that he passed on this sort of new approach to life, focusing upon individual behavior, individual enlightenment. And he passed it on then to a disciple who became the major leader and sort of real founding figure of Taoism, who was actually named Li Er, that reportedly was his actual given name. But in later years, he came to be called Lao Tzu, which simply means the old philosopher. So the earliest surviving chronicles say that Lao Tzu worked for a time as an archivist for a regional prince, one of these regional local rulers or potentates, or some say that he actually worked at the royal Zhou court at Luoyang. And he became a learned teacher and gathered followers who studied with him and gained wisdom from him. But over time, he became so fully disillusioned that he resigned from his post and began traveling westward through China to seek out a wild place to become a hermit. And at one point, as he was crossing one of these many borders, as he worked his way west from state to state through China, he was detained by customs officials. And these officials according to this early legend, only allowed him to continue on on his journey if he remained for a time and paid a toll in the form of a book with his teachings. So they kind of demanded his wisdom as payment for his passage. And the resulting book then was the Tao Te Ching, which roughly means the book of virtue and the way. So it's very dubious whether this story is true, but it provides an origin myth for what the Tao Te Ching is and where it came from. It was sort of a, a body, a short, a short collection of teachings extracted kind of by force from Lao Tzu. And this became the core book of Taoist doctrine. So as I said, it's very short, only 5,000 words. And it emphasizes, paradoxically, the book emphasizes that the fundamental truths of life cannot be captured in words or language. They're fundamentally ineffable and only grasped 
through experience and through intuition. But nonetheless, there are some basic core ideas and teachings that we can describe in the Tao Te Ching. So first and foremost, of course, is the idea of Tao, which roughly means the way, or you could elaborate in translating it as the way of things or the natural course of things. So the Tao is a sort of hidden order, something that springs out of the nature of things themselves, which cannot be captured by reason or language, but only intuitively. And it's exemplified by the sort of repeating course that one can see in the cycle of the seasons and in the cycles of plant and animal life, which seem to have a sort of hidden order that one only grasps by observation and experience. And according to the Tao Te Ching, the best thing for a person to do is to withdraw out of society, which is an imposed artificial order, and instead to learn to live in accordance with the Tao. And this then is the only way to obtain real happiness or to accomplish anything of value. And this, it seems, was a lot of the revolutionary element of Taoism, the idea that one does not accomplish things by becoming a ruler or a, an administrator or a scholar. One accomplishes things by living in accord with the Tao, which is fundamentally achieved by the individual in nature. So then there's a derivative concept of de, which means basically virtue or goodness. And roughly, it's the good character that springs from habits of behavior that are attuned to the Tao. And all of this, of course, can sound very abstract and sort of airy, but a lot of the Tao Te Ching and later Taoist texts try over and over again to find the right metaphors, the right analogies, you could say the right uh, parables to convey what this means. And there's a very, very important metaphor running all through these Taoist texts, which is the metaphor of water. So if you think of the motion of water, there is a kind of pattern to it, even if there are floods and waterfalls and and deltas and whirlpools, nonetheless, there's a sort of overall pattern, a guiding pattern to it. The water always flows downward, seeking out its most natural level, the lowest that it can find. And in this way, it can be taken to represent the humility of the good person, the person of virtue, who always seeks out his natural place, which is low, humble, unobtrusive. Also, if you watch water in moving, it always follows the path of least resistance. It is always gently seeking out unblocked channels and pathways. And in this way, it is, it is not forceful, right? It, it doesn't artificially cut a straight line through the landscape. It accommodates itself to the landscape. Yet also over time, it can have deep effects by a sort of invisible action. So even though the water is always seeking out that easiest open path, also it can over time carve its way even through hard rock. And there's a parable in the Tao Te Ching, a, a poem that says, quote, as the soft yield of water cleaves obstinate stone, so to yield with life solves the insoluble. And this can be taken as an illustration of another central concept in Taoism, which is Wu Wei. And that's a word that also has been translated many different ways as yielding or non-action. Although at the same time, there's a paradox that this Wu Wei, on the one hand, it's non-action, but on the other hand, it is the highest and best form of action. So you could translate it paradoxically as action through non-action. And it's captured, I think, in this implied contrast in the poem, where there's an implied contrast between the violent action of a hammer and chisel that cleave by force into the rock and can break it in all kinds of uh, unpredictable, destructive ways, and on the other hand, the action of the water, which splits through the rock by gentle, slow motion over time. And hence, the ideal person in the Taoist view is one who is not inactive, Right? Not one who, who simply gives up and does nothing, but one who works by subtle action over time that accommodates to one's surroundings. 
So the philosophy of Taoism is fundamentally personal. It's about the individual and his relationship with his environment. And it rejects political power, political authority as fundamentally arbitrary, oppressive. And hence, in this way, it does have political implications. Although one could say it's an apolitical or anti-political philosophy, it has political implications. And when Taoists comment on society, they advocate for a kind of anarcho-primitivism. They support the idea of a society based on farming and small villages, as well as hunting, fishing, trapping, but a way of life that is closely tied to nature with not too much trade or travel from one village or settlement to another, and hence that cannot support the tyrannical superstructures of a kingdom or an empire. So Taoism, it seems, first emerged out of this, this hermit culture in the spring and autumn period, and then developed and collected core texts through the Warring States period, but it was always in dialogue. It was sort of in an inextricably interwoven dialogue with other schools of thought that responded to the crisis of that era completely differently and sought out ways to restore and shore up the social order and the legitimacy of society and the state. And the main alternate school of thought that they were always in dialogue with was Confucianism. So this was a, a different school of thought that tried to rebuild a basis for social order and authority in the absence of a strong king or emperor. And the Confucians relied on the idea of moral education and pious observance of custom and tradition. And ultimately, they imagined what you could see as a kind of fractal society with strong bonds and ties uniting people at all different levels of society in a kind of fractal or pyramidal form. And they were all based at all the different levels, basically on the filial relationship, the relationship between father and son, of the passing on of a legacy and of reverence and appreciation for one's forebears. And so they imagined you could see as a kind of decentralized patriarchy, right, with authority embedded in every level of society, but always rooted in that moral relationship of father and son, rather than in brute force. And we know a bit more about where Confucianism actually came from. More is recorded about it. And the founding thinker, of course, was a scholar named Kong Chu, whose name has been westernized into Confucius. So that's how we normally talk about him. So we know a bit about the life of Confucius. He was born in 551 BC. You know, we don't know the exact dates of Lao Tzu's life, but it seems that Confucius may have lived about the same time as Lao Tzu or maybe just after. And he grew up in the state of Lu. It seems that most likely his father was a noble warrior aristocrat from uh, descended from Zhou imperial officials. So there was that legacy and link back to the old order of the Zhou dynasty. And his mother was from a local indigenous tribe. So Confucius's life might have been a kind of hybrid or bridge between the sort of imperial world and cult and the local uh, tribal people. But he was in the state of Lu, which was a relatively small state but located right in the heart of the fertile and populous East China Plain. So they were sort of holding out, basically surrounded by large, powerful, prosperous states in that core area. And apparently Confucius worked for a time as a grain manager and administrator for the state of Lu, but he kind of flunked out. He could not handle the volatile and cutthroat politics of the court. And it seems probably he was too earnest, too idealistic, and he was sort of pushed out of politics. And in particular, he was undermined by the powerful land-holding noble families of Lu, who were all, you know, striving for, for power and prestige, and who undermined even the princely court, much like the regional princes in the past had undermined the authority of the Zhou kings. So Confucius came to really detest and fear the unrestrained egotism and hunger for power of these local noble families. And he began teaching philosophy 
in the court of Lu based mainly on annals and chronicles of the past and used these sort of collections of past events to make arguments against the extravagance, the power, the greed of these noble families. He was, it seems, a prolific writer, and some, traditionally, many have attributed all sorts of books to him, saying that he wrote uh, the Yi Jing, or Book of Changes, as, and the Shu Jing, uh, but he also, he may have actually written all or part of the Spring and Autumn Annals, this chronicle of the history of Lu, from which we get the name of that age, the Spring and Autumn period. So it's possible he may have actually penned that, but we are not sure. But it's clear that Confucius continually presented himself as only a transmitter of tradition and of the past and not as an inventor. He abhorred innovation. He looked back to a golden age of the Zhou dynasty, which he believed could be restored with the right mindset. And as he developed his ideas, he tried to promote them to various rulers around China, not just in Lu. And he set out around the year 492 BC, he set out on a long journey, traveling around China, trying to find a state that would hire him and put his philosophy into practice. But he returned after nine or 10 years back to Lu, disappointed and disillusioned. And he spent the final three years of his life just teaching and writing about his ideas and died in 479 BC. Now Confucius, it seems, saw his career as at best a partial success. He was disappointed that he didn't affect a sort of spiritual philosophical revolution. But nonetheless, after his death, his students, who were very much devoted to his vision, spread his influence far and wide. And his ideas eventually created the lasting foundation for social and political thought in China, really possibly the most profoundly influential Chinese person that there's ever been in China, and he's sometimes been called the uncrowned emperor. Now, again, many of his ideas are lost. We do not have a treatise penned by Confucius himself, the way we have the Tao Te Ching in the Taoist school, but we do have the Analects. An Analect means basically collected words or gleanings, and this is a collection that Confucius's devotees gradually formed and edited, putting together his different ideas and utterances in the form of dialogues, with Confucius responding to questions and problems presented to him by his students. And the Analects only reached their complete form, like we see today, several centuries later. So much like, you know, if you look at the Christian Gospels, we do not have those direct words recorded right at the moment, but we have the memory, the sort of refracted memory of the teacher's ideas from later generations. So from the Analects and some other texts, we can basically discern core doctrines of Confucius's views. So Confucius saw good conduct and good government as based not simply in the imperial tie to heaven, which he doesn't really comment on much, but rather as based in a dialectic between two basic forces or principles. So one on the one hand is jin or run, the pronunciation can vary, jin or run, which is the basic impulse towards love and benevolence, which he believes is inborn in all people, but it can be damaged or diminished by dishonesty, greed, and the corruption of the world. So the basic problem is how to protect or maintain this good impulse of jun or run. And the answer to that then is li. So li is a very complex concept with evolving meanings that has sort of shifted over the centuries. And it seems in the Zhou era, li basically just meant ritual, or specifically the ritual offerings that were made to the imperial ancestors in the ancestral cult. Now in the Analects, which describe Confucius's views, it seems that Li has changed, it has broadened its meaning to mean basically ritual as such, or even more broadly, the observance of custom. And so the observance of customs, things like proper greetings, proper gift exchange, these rituals and customs are a way of instilling habits which then shape character and which cultivate and develop and shape 
that impulse of jin or benevolence or goodwill. And it also li combats excessive pride and lust for power, doing things like showing proper respects to one's superiors or humbling oneself are a way of tamping down pride and lust for power and also of shaping the impulse of jin into more concrete forms. So one might feel a sort of basic, broad uh, benevolence towards humankind, but that is not enough to maintain a good s social order. One has to develop a sense of duty attaching to one's particular social station. So one's station as a servant, a son, a husband, a ruler, etc., etc. And the basic sort of building block that undergirds each of these relationships is filial piety. And filial piety, it's, it's important, is not simply absolute obedience, right? He's not describing authoritarianism. It's not absolute obedience, but rather observance of proper duty as defined by custom and tradition, which one performs willingly and happily as an expression of jinn. So Confucius also hated hypocrisy. He abhorred ritual that was not informed and animated by sincere feeling. And he's quoted as saying, I cannot bear to see the forms of Li performed by those who have no reverence in their hearts. Confucius also emphasizes the proper use of language, so-called rectification of names, this sort of principle or practice of rectification of names, which is using always the right names for things because the proper name encapsulates in it a whole social world. So for instance, a title like prince or lord does not just mean a set of powers that, you know, I get to whop my tenants over the head or whatever, but rather a set of duties and life ideals. And in this way, you can see a very fundamental contrast with Taoism, right? So Confucianism and Taoism both see language as fundamentally social, but then the question is, what is the ultimate ground of reality? And to Confucians, the basic reality of the world is social. It is in how you position yourself and define your world by your social roles and relationships. Therefore, language captures that fundamental reality, whereas Taoists reject the social as artificial and hence view language as distorting and deceptive. And whereas the Taoists use water, the sort of natural, unthinking flow of water, they use that as their central metaphor for what for the essence of the world the confucians point to music so music is a, a crucial metaphor and inspiration for confucian philosophy and early texts say that confucius in his travels when he traveled around china he went to the state of qi in the east and he was enthralled by the music of qi especially as performed in the pageants at royal and noble courts and he saw this as a model for social relations. People governing by inspiration and even by the charms of music rather than by force or by fear. And if you look at a musical performance, there are different instruments, sounds, tones that are being made to form into rhythms and harmonies, right? Literally harmonizing. And so you can see a sort of unity in variety, where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And to Confucius and his followers, this showed how the greatest, most beautiful things in life are achieved socially by the harmonization of different actors. So it seems that at some point, although it's hard to pick apart exactly in all these different surviving books and sources that have changed and been revised over time, it seems that at some point Taoists and Confucians came into contention. And Taoists at different times put forward arguments trying to refute Confucianism or, or to sort of pull the rug out from under its basic assumptions. And Taoists argued that these central doctrines of Confucianism about jin and li, ritual, custom, virtue, righteousness, were all sort of artificial concoctions that were only invented as bandages or remedies to try to shore up this unstable structure of society because people had lost that real, that true underlying essence of life, which was the Tao.
So you can see this even in the Tao Te Ching itself. And this passage may have not been in the most original form, but may have been added in in the course of these encounters and debates with Confucianism. But the Tao Te Ching says, quote, When the great Tao is abandoned, therefore there are the doctrines of benevolence and righteousness. When wisdom and knowledge emerged, therefore there is perjury. When the six family relations were not in harmony, therefore there is the need for filial piety. When a state is in disorder, therefore there is the need for loyalty. So the Tao Te Ching sort of describes these fundamental principles as really just partial remedies trying to shore up a disintegrating system because it is not fundamentally in harmony with the true order of things. So both of these basic schools of Taoism and Confucianism, it seems, uh, developed through the Warring States period and then began to trickle down and to gain more popular audiences. And you can see a an evolution from generation to generation where doctrines that really had been geared at and shaped by a small elite in society became more popularized. And it seems that as schools of thought became more organized, they had to compete not just for elite patrons, but also for broader popularity. And a lot of these ideas became more accessible and more applicable to common people's lives. And the doctrines themselves show a greater appreciation for the importance and the wisdom of ordinary people. So if we look at Taoism, for one thing, as it evolved through the Warring States period, it was taken up by teachers who embraced a more populist line of thinking. So De, this quality of virtue of goodness, was achievable not just by ascetic hermits, Right? That's what the earliest Taoists were. They were sort of extremists living in isolation or an ascetic lifestyle. This goodness was achievable not just by ascetic hermits, but even by ordinary folk going about their working lives. And the big uh, propagator of this sort of new, more popular Taoism was Chuangzi, who was a Taoist philosopher and writer, right? So he... They were writing down more of their ideas, which allowed them to be circulated and shared with more people. And Chuangzi lived, it seems, in the 300s BC. He was reportedly a minor government official in the state of Sung, which was in eastern China, just south of Lu, so same basic area. And he lived a hermitic life. He lived in isolation as a way not simply of uh, perfecting himself, but more so as a way of setting a model, setting an example for people who who wanted some sort of fulfillment and satisfaction who couldn't get it from gaining high government offices. So it takes on, I think you can see, a a sort of populist cast and tone that, that the ordinary life of the person farming or hunting or fishing is more truly spiritual fulfilling than being a a prime minister or an ambassador. And there's a story that captures this that is a sort of famous popular story about Chuangzi, which I'll read in in this translation. So in this popular story, uh, Chuangzi has become famous and renowned, and he's invited to take up high government office, like the prime minister of the state of Chu. So the story says, quote, The prince of Chu sent two high officials to ask Chuangzi to take charge of the government and become chief minister. They found Chuangzi fishing in Pu. Intent on what he was doing, he listened without turning his head. At last he said, I have been told there is in the capital a sacred tortoise, which has been dead for three thousand years, and that the prince keeps the tortoise carefully enclosed in a chest on the altar of his ancestral temple. Now, would this tortoise rather be dead, but considered holy, or alive and wagging its tail in the mud? The two officials answered that it would prefer to be alive and wagging its tail in the mud. Go away then, shouted Chuangzi. I too will wag my tail in the mud here. So you can see in this sort of parable, Chuangzi is funny. Uh, He's having fun in his life. He is able to reject and really mock both the idea of political power and also the cult of ancestral offerings at once. 
and argue that there is more that is good and true and fulfilling in the life of a fisherman. And it seems that Chuang Tzu also wrote a book discussing the different ways that one can act in accord with Tao, not just necessarily by living as a hermit, but by doing all kinds of work and pursuits. And there's another famous story that deals with another prince, Prince Hui, who saw his cook processing the carcass of a bull maybe for a feast or also maybe for sacrificial offerings. And the prince, through what he sees, is able to see that there is actually greater wisdom in what the cook is doing than in the cult of offerings that he oversees as the prince. So the story says, quote, Prince Hui's cook was cutting up a bullock. Every blow of his hand, every heave of his shoulders, every tread of his foot, every thrust of his knee, every sound of rent flesh, and every note of the chopper was in perfect harmony, rhythmical like a dance, harmonious like a piece of music. Excellent, cried the prince who was watching him. Yours is skill indeed. My lord, replied the cook, I have devoted myself to Tao, which is superior to mere skill. When I first started to cut up oxen, I saw before me only whole carcasses. After three years' practice, I saw no more whole animals. And now I work with my mind and not with my eyes, because I am attuned to eternal principles. I follow the natural structure, my chopper slipping through existing openings or cavities. I avoid both joints and bones. A good cook changes his chopper once a year because he cuts. An average cook needs a new chopper every month because he hacks. But I have used this chopper for 19 years, and although I have dealt with many thousand carcasses, its edge is as fresh from the whetstone. For where the parts join, there are chinks into which my thin blade can easily slip. A complicated joint requires caution, that's all. I fix my eyes on it, I move slowly and gently apply my chopper until it gives and separates like crumbling earth. Then I am satisfied and clean my blade for another day. Well done, cried the prince. From the words of this cook, I have learned how to manage my own life. So in this story, on the one hand, the cook's work is serving as a metaphor, right? a metaphor for how the good, virtuous person should behave and conduct his life. But also it's literal and it's, it has very vivid, even visceral imagery of a man doing this sort of dirty work of cutting up animals. And yet it makes it clear how this, can, this sort of work can also be elevating depending on how you do it, doing it with intuition, with experience, such that he can do it with his eyes closed, as he says. And he does it by finding the natural paths, the natural grooves, uh, accommodating himself to the sort of hidden nature of the material he's dealing with. And he even says explicitly, I am working with the Tao, and that is greater and higher than mere skill. Right? So there's this sort of effort to to elevate, to argue that ordinary work by ordinary people can be elevating beyond just its practical uses. So this sort of popularization was going on at the same time also that Taoism was more and more integrating in metaphysics and cosmology. We don't know a lot about how this happened, but it seems that over the course of the Warring States period, a lot of the sort of folk cosmology, spirituality, magic that had been circulating among the ordinary people was synthesized into Taoism. And a little bit we know of this because of an important archaeological discovery in 1993 when an important tomb at a site called Guodian was uncovered. And in it were various different texts, I think 16 different texts of philosophy showing different views and different schools of thought, and some of which show a lot of overlap and cross-fertilization between Confucian and Taoist ideas. But one important text discovered at Guodian was, was a, another cosmogony called The Great One Gives Birth to Water. And this cosmogony is similar in a lot of ways to the ancient story of Panku that I described earlier, but it's even more metaphysical and mystical even. So we'll just read a couple parts of this short text, which describes uh, an entity called the Great One, which might be like heaven, the divine principle, 
creating the world. And it says, quote, the Great One produced water. The water, in return, assisted the Great One, thus forming the sky. The sky, returning, assisted the Great One, thus forming the earth. The sky and the earth, again, assisted one another, thus forming the numinous and the luminous. The numinous and the luminous, again, assisted one another, thus forming yin and yang. Yin and yang assisted one another, thus forming the four seasons. The four seasons, again, assisted one another, thus forming cold and heat. Cold and heat again assisted one another, thus forming moisture and aridity. Moisture and aridity again assisted one another, formed a year, and that was all. For this reason, the Great One hides in water and moves with the seasons. So obviously there's a lot going on in just that short passage from The Great One Gives Birth to Water. But one thing you, you can see is it follows a sort of doctrine of emanations, similar to what you might have seen in Neoplatonism or Gnosticism, the idea that different spheres, different realms of the cosmos emanate one from another out from the divine principle. But in this version, it's always dualities, right? Hot and dry, cold and wet. Each one, it's one duality sort of coupling like a divine couple and then producing another couple and another in outward emanations. So it maintains this idea of balanced dualities. And in the middle of them, of course, is yin and yang, right? The masculine and feminine principles. So you're seeing that sort of metaphysics being developed, woven together into Taoism. And also a new meaning is being given to the metaphor of water, right? Water is used all through Taoist thought as this sort of central symbol. But here we're told the Great One, through these outward emanations, the divine presence of the Great One is in water itself. So water has, you could see, a sort of mystical or metaphysical power. And I would argue most likely this idea that there are, that there's a divine principle that can be found in visible and tangible things, most particularly in water, could then provide a basis for magic and divination, right? Folk magic involving wells or streams, healing or, or divinatory magic could be then woven into this greater body of Taoist teachings. And so Taoist philosophy more and more was a, a synthesis of the ideas of the Tao Te Ching and popular beliefs and practices. And then meanwhile, on the other hand, in the Confucian school, there also was a parallel and really profound popularization. So as Confucianism developed and spread, it was carried on in numerous different lines of teachers. But one of them, it seems, one line or, or lineage of teachers was especially prestigious, and you could see as kind of the mainstream of the inheritors of Confucius. And that line actually runs through Confucius's own grandson, who was named Zisi. And Zisi was the author of another six texts that were found at Guodian. So it seems he was very prolific and popular. And his views are certainly Confucian, and they, they certainly build on Confucius's foundation. But he has a different focus and emphasis. He's focused less on the social order and more so on the perfection of individual character. And the qualities, he, he discusses the, the, the cultivation of particular qualities or virtues like righteousness and wisdom, which he argues are rooted in human nature, right? So human nature is not just this sort of raw, unformed sense of benevolence called jin, but it actually contains greater development, greater sophistication. And one of the students of Zisi was named Munke, or his name has been westernized into Mencius. And Mencius, it seems, so he, he is in this sort of main line or mainstream of Confucian teachers. And Mencius became by far the most influential, most impactful interpreter of Confucius. And Mencius, it seems, was from the state of Zhou on the eastern coast of China near the Shandong Peninsula. And he reportedly, according to early chronicles and histories, he was educated mainly by his mother, who was herself very philosophical-minded and very exacting 
and she wanted to expose Mencius to all different aspects of life so that he could understand and see the wider principles of life. And when he grew up, he became a teacher at the Royal Academy of Qi, which was the main really big, powerful state in the east of China. And he developed his own version of Confucianism, which in some respects is more internal and more individualist than the Confucius of the Analects, and also in many respects is more populist and more egalitarian. And it puts less emphasis on authority and the importance of rule following. And there are changes and adjustments in some of the core concepts of Confucianism. So human nature is seen as the real root and basis of wisdom, not so much custom and tradition. You could say he has a more optimistic view of unformed human nature. And jin or benevolence is seen as almost sufficient for virtue. Mencius certainly does call for education and character formation, just like all Confucians always do. But in his version, this education is not aimed so much at inculcating reverence or filial piety, but it's more aimed at preserving and cultivating that core of natural benevolence. So Mencius has this very nuanced view, where in his opinion, only the educated gentleman, right, the gentleman of the she class, only he can have fully good character. But at the same time, all people, regardless of class or education, have an inborn potential for goodness and wisdom that should be honored. And Mencius, it seems in his philosophy, he may have revised the meaning of the term Li, or it may have already evolved and changed by his age. So in Mencius's writings, Li no longer means ritual or even strict observance of custom, like it did for Confucius. Rather, it more just means personal manners, courteousness, conscientiousness. So it's something that can be fully realized on the individual level, even in ordinary everyday interactions and outside of tradition-bound reciprocal relationships, which in Confucius's view are the actual context of Li. So Li in this form, in this more generalized and personal individual form, can be used as a basis then for moral authority above and beyond formally constituted social authority. So when it comes to politics and government, Mencius actually put forward what's been called the Chinese Constitution, a set of arguments and ideas about political authority. So in Mencius's view, the ultimate priority of government is always the happiness of the people. And this basic sense, it seems, was pretty widespread in the Warring States period. And it is seen even in the Shu Jing, the historical chronicle which contains a poem saying, quote, Heaven sees according to what the people see. Heaven hears according to what the people hear. So this is important and complex idea that, you know, for thousands of years, people in China, especially in, you know, in authority, had held that the power of the state derives ultimately from the king's relationship to heaven and the so-called mandate of heaven. But... In this later era, after really anything like uh, Zhou imperial authority had long broken down, people had to look to the support of the populace and to say that in some way the support of heaven, the mandate of heaven, is actually transmitted through the common people and it is their support that actually upholds the legitimacy of the government. So in this way, one could circumvent the imperial cult and argue that rather it's the people who mediate between the state and heaven. And Mencius really tried to take this new way of thinking that really enshrines the the favor and the support of the common people and weave it into a, a broader sort of Confucian doctrine of the good society and the good state. And he writes at one point, quote, people are to be valued most the altars of the grain and land next, the ruler least. So although the, the ruler is the first man, at the same time, he is merely a servant of all else, of, of the people and the ancestors. And he goes on, Hence, by winning the favor of the common people, you become king. By winning the favor of the king, you become a lord. By winning the favor of the lord, you become a grandee. 
If the Lord endangers the altars, replace him. If proper sacrifices were made at the altars, but there is still drought and flood, replace the altar. (laughs) So in this way, the gods, the ancestors, the spirits are called upon to sustain the grain, the harvest, to support the people. And if they fail in their duty, you replace them. The altar is not working. He also says if the Lord is not helping the people and keep upholding the social order, replace the Lord. Now you might notice there's one other element in here that he doesn't say, although it's implied, which is what if the king or the ruler is failing in his duties? Don't you just replace him? Well, that is the implication that many people take from Mencius, although he, you know, maybe was on dangerous ground and was careful not to say that exactly explicitly. So there's this constant question then that's left open in Mencius. What about emperors or kings that rule badly? And it doesn't, he doesn't say outright that the people can overthrow them. But he does, in his philosophies, he does cite favorably past instances of the overthrow of bad emperors, such as the last emperors of the Xia and Shang dynasties, who were overthrown and replaced by more virtuous leaders. And hence, you could say there is a clearly implied right of revolution. And something similar, and again, we have to be careful here with making comparisons with with other civilizations, but clearly there is something similar to the Western idea of popular sovereignty, the idea that the the legitimacy of a ruler really is rooted in the consent of those that they rule. Mencius and his followers also, in their way, tried to refute Taoism. And in their eyes, they saw Taoism as overly fatalistic, as despairing of human society. Mencius at one point mocks Chuang Tse and saying that he wants to go live in the mud among animals and somehow find happiness that way, when what in fact what people really need is a way to find happiness and harmony among other humans. It's simply never going to be the case that everybody is a hermit living in the swamps or the mountains. People have to live together. And Mencius also rejected the idea of Wu Wei, or yielding, or non-action. And he saw that as leading to defeatism and the loss of important opportunities to work to improve life for all. So there was this tension and this constant dialectic between Taoism as sort of the premier school that rejected society and Confucianism as the premier school that tried to perfect society and restore its its goodness its legitimacy and these two you know took jibes at each other but it can be exaggerated sometimes it's not as if the they were necessarily at war and sometimes the the conflict between them could be uh, exaggerated in later years as people added in more and more arguments trying to draw distinctions and refute their rivals but in this early era, it seems that there was some cross-fertilization and some common ground. Also, in the later Warring States period, there was a further, it seems a further proliferation where more different schools came to the fore and found audiences and supporters in different sectors of society. And in particular, two new schools or tendencies emerged that in some ways grew out of Confucianism. So once, once Confucianism was really the broadly accepted viewpoint in the Warring States period, nonetheless, people took sort of different opposing tendencies and impulses out of Confucian thought and developed them into their own feuding schools. So really, by the end of the Warring States period, two new schools had come to the fore and had really become the main contenders and antagonists for support and followers, and those were Moism and Legalism. So Moism first was a very popular school of thought, and there were some Confucian philosophers who actually complained that it seems like everybody's become a Moist. But Moism was probably the most widespread philosophy in the later Warring States period, especially in the 200s BC. And it was founded by someone called Mo De, who also then was called Mo Tse, or Mo the Teacher. And Mo De is very mysterious. 
He was said to be from the state of Sung, right, in sort of east central China, the same homeland as Chuangtze. And he lived in the 400s BC, just a little bit after Confucius. And his philosophy was very humanitarian. It involved, it centered on the search for ways to minimize human suffering. Moists were strictly pacifist. They tried to prevent war or to in some way slow war in order to limit violence and suffering. They promoted defensive tactics in war, especially siege warfare, the creation of defenses and supplies to block out enemies with minimal violence. So they believed in a kind of harm reduction. And in fact, the core book of the philosophy, which is simply called Moze, about a quarter of it is about siege warfare tactics. Their doctrines were consequentialist, right? Actions have value based on their impact on other people. And they were utilitarian, utilitarian in both senses, both of promoting overall aggregate human good and also in their rejection of anything that they saw as extravagant or impractical or purely aesthetic. So there was a search for universal rules and standards that were based in the calculation of the greatest good for all. They condemned ritual, lavish entertainment, and even music. They saw musical performance as wasteful, needless, and they associated it with aristocratic power and extravagance and with Confucians. So music became a kind of flashpoint of this distinction between mainstream Confucians and Moists. And Moism, it seems, was very popular, especially among the Kung, the artisanal class. And artisans around different parts of China actually, it seems, pooled resources and formed a sort of humanitarian core of experts in defensive warfare who would sometimes rush in when states were under attack. And this was a time of increasing war and destruction among neighboring states. This Kung uh, Moist Corps would move in to small states that were under attack and in danger of massacre or destruction and would come to the rescue and set up tactical defenses, earthworks, fortifications, whatever, to try to stall the war and prevent uh, bloodshed. So they were they were sort of, a, you know, doctors without borders of the warring states era. They also rejected the idea of a special regard or attachment to one's particular family, clan, or state. And they argued that if people learned to love far away tribes and states the same as they loved their own tribe or their own state, then this would actually end war. And that was their sort of ultimate vision. Now this too, of course, was an attack on core ideas of Confucianism, filial piety, reverence, for one's superiors, for one's forebears, for one's fathers. And it provoked some response from Mencius and his sort of mainstream Confucian school. And Mencius argued for the continuing need for specificity, for specific ties of loyalty and devotion. And Mencius asked, how could you possibly expect to love distant peoples if you don't first love your own family and those immediately around you? And I think you can see in this contention between Moists and Mencians really an ongoing dilemma, right? An unresolved dilemma that's continued through the ages of how do you balance your particular attachment and devotion to your immediate community against regard and goodwill towards all humankind and can those two things how can those two things coexist so the moists arguably took certain more optimistic ideas from the mention version of confucianism the idea of universal benevolence goodwill love towards all humankind the goodness of human nature they took it in that extreme but at the same time, certain Shia administrators in different states around China who were trying to accomplish certain things and were finding people to be resistant, unreliable, they took the opposite tack and went to the opposite extreme with, you could see, in some ways, a more uh, pessimistic view of human nature, although that's not necessarily how all of them saw it. And this gave rise then to 
the sort of antithetical stream of thought, which we call legalism. And legalism began as an offshoot, again, of Confucianism, as certain scholars moved in a much more authoritarian direction and really emphasizing the critical importance of obedience and authority. And these scholars got patronage in particular states as those states tried to militarize and to mobilize all the resources that they could to try to defeat their neighbors and hence dominate and unify China. So whereas on the one hand, Moists reject war completely and believe that through love and benevolence, war can be ended. On the other hand, certain states believe that the solution to the warring states period that this era of warfare will only end when somebody wins and beats all of their rivals and hence unifies China. And these legalist scholars who explored ways of militarizing and mobilizing society, they included many accomplished officials, such as Shangyang, who was hired by the Qin state in the 300s BC and oversaw the thorough reform of the Qin state for the purpose of military power and most of these early legalists were men of action and men in government who didn't necessarily have all that much time to you know, propound their ideas in treatises or teach in schools. But their philosophical ideas were eventually synthesized by another scholar named Han Fei, who wrote a book called The Han Fei Tse in the 200s BC as a sort of distillation of the legalist point of view. And Han Fei rejected the very idea of a fixed human nature. He argued that instead people respond to their environment and to incentives. And he told the story of people that you encounter on the roads at different times in different years. In times of prosperity and abundance, people are welcoming in guests, they're giving out alms to the poor, they're generous and open-handed. Whereas in times of famine, they are greedy and closed-fisted and afraid of their neighbors. So there are these radically different responses to different conditions and different incentives. There's no one fixed nature. People are not just greedy or just generous. It depends on incentives. And so leaders, effective leaders, must manage people's behavior through rewards and punishments. And hence Han Fei uh, expounded ultimately he expounded a kind of broken windows philosophy where he called for very harsh punishments even for small crimes and he argued that these sort of harsh punishments are in fact benevolent if you if you respond strictly and harshly to even small misdeeds or infractions you prevent escalation into bigger and worser crimes and hence bigger and worser punishments so in his view, it is actually beneficial and benevolent to always crack down on even the most minor misdeeds or crimes. He argued that it was the absolute duty of subjects to obey the law and their rulers. He doesn't subscribe to any sort of right of revolution or anything like that. People must obey. It's an absolute duty. It doesn't matter if it springs from benevolence or jin or run or whatever. But on the other hand, the leaders have a duty to rule effectively according to the law. So he believed that ruler's authority in this way was absolute, but it was not arbitrary. They could demand absolute obedience, but they could not rule arbitrarily. They must operate by consistent laws, because only then can laws and punishments work as incentives. If the ruler rules arbitrarily and their actions don't make sense or are unpredictable, then they will not manage people's behavior towards shared ends. So they have to work according to consistent laws applied consistently to all cases. And this too flew in the face of traditional mainstream Confucian doctrine, which said that authorities must be merciful and they must be flexible and take into account the particularities of cases. So in the, in the mainstream Confucian view, rulers and administrators have developed their moral sense through their education, and it is rooted in both Jin and Li, and hence they are then equipped through this character formation to judge particular cases and seek justice. But according to legalism, consistency is more important.
government and law can only work if they are absolutely consistent across the board. So the legalist doctrine became predominant specifically in the states of Han and Qin, Han in eastern China and Qin in the western end of China, because those are the two states that were trying to make serious bids for supremacy. And legalism was adopted as the official state philosophy first in the Qin state, and then after Qin, uh, the emperor Qin Shi Huangde unified China, it became the official doctrine of the new empire. But arguably, at least according to many chronicles, this doctrine backfired because it created unpopularity in the sense that the, the, the new Qin empire was repressive, tyrannical, and that it lacked legitimacy because it did not follow the norms, the customs, the teachings of mainstream Confucian ideas. It lost its legitimacy among both elites and the populace. At least that's the way many observers described it. And after not very long, the Qin dynasty was overthrown by rebels. Rebels who uh, gathered together various critics and opponents of the Qin Empire and who espoused Confucianism and Confucian ideas about legitimate government. And this rebel group may have found this Confucianism especially appealing because through Mencius and through Mencius's interpretations, Confucian doctrines could provide a rationale for their own overthrow of Qin. And hence, this new Confucianism was then enshrined as the new state philosophy when rebels seized power and established the Han dynasty. And the Han dynasty was a thoroughly Confucian dynasty. But nonetheless, even despite this, legalism and Taoism continued to be remembered and to have real devotees. And these different schools of thought later intercombined and interacted through the years and then further cross hybridized with Buddhism after Buddhism was introduced into China during the Han Dynasty. And this new presence, this new set of ideas uh, can be seen as a watershed. And the, the arrival of Buddhism in China has been taken as the end of so-called early China and the beginning of a new era, which hopefully I'll be able to talk about later when we return to China. So thank you so much for listening. And again, if you can help to support these lectures, keep them coming. Or if you want to hear any of my patron-only materials, including my recent long discussion of conspiracy theories, please go to my Patreon page and support at any level, even if it's just a dollar. Thank you.